Jesus is there at Golgotha, and uh, John does not tell us about the, the um, soldiers offering him soured wine mixed with vinegar. Now, of course, wine does turn into, becomes vinegar, but they add vinegar to it to try to, to, try to uh, give him uh, uh, something to dull the pain as they drive the nails into his hands. But John doesn't tell us about that. Neither, neither does John tell us what Mark records for us. Mark records Peter's eyewitness account that says they crucified Jesus right at 9 o'clock in the morning. John doesn't tell us that. John just simply goes to uh, the fact that they crucified him between two men. Let's pick up there in verse 18 of chapter 19. It says, that There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Catch that? It wasn't in the city. It was near the city. Jesus is crucified outside the city walls in a place called Golgotha that looks like, because it looked like the skull. Now, many of you all have been to Israel. And there's a couple of places they show you where they think that he was crucified. And there's a couple of places they show you where they think that he was buried in the tomb. Probably, in my opinion, the one that is called Gordon's Calvary is probably the correct place because of where it is outside the city, and the tomb will be nearby. Now, he put this inscription, uh, the King of the Jews, up on top, and he did it in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Hebrew is the language of the Jews. Latin is the official language of all the legal paperwork in the Roman Empire at this point in time. And the Greek is written for those who pass by who still speak Greek and who would not understand either Hebrew or Latin. So the chief priests of the Jews, that's the, the, the heads of the Sanhedrin, they were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but, he said, but that he said... I am the king of the Jews. Don't put that he's the king of the Jews. Say he says, I am the king of the Jews. And of course, Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. It is there. It's nailed to the cross. That's what it's going to be. The deal is, is Pilate's actually writing a joke. He's making a joke on the Sanhedrin, and they are afraid that the joke will be on them. And you know what it is on them, because he is the king of the Jews. And so they don't want that written. They want it, uh, want it to say that, put the blame on him that he said, I am the king of the Jews. No. Uh, he, and what Pilate actually writes is the truth, and he puts it up there. And by the way, a centurion soldier is going to claim it to be the truth uh, later on. Well, Saul of Tarsus is evidently there. Uh, not, um, Saul of Tarsus is evidently um, not there yet, uh, but he'll be coming up in just a little bit. Saul was probably with Pilate. Uh, and heard what was going on. Saul was one of those Sanhedrin guys who's saying, don't tell him this right that he's king of the Jews. Well, he's not out at Calvary yet. They're, they're nailing Jesus to the cross, and they've put in that inscription. They've gone back to tell uh, Pilate, no, no, to change that. No, but he's not going to change it. Uh, John doesn't tell us about Jesus saying, forgive them, for I know not what they do. But he is there, he's gone and he's gotten Mary and, and, the, and, some, and Mary's sister and some other women, and he's brought them, and so they are there for John to see them taking the clothing of Jesus and dividing it into four parts, and then when they come to that tunic, they don't divide it because it is a precious piece of material, totally woven together in one piece, and they decide to take it, and they're going to cast lots for it. In fact, that's what it says here in, in uh, chapter 19, verse 23. John sees that happening, and then he tells us, this is to fulfill the scripture that says, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is to fulfill the scripture of Psalms chapter 22, verse 18. It had to be done. It had to be done. It's a promise that had to be fulfilled. And they fulfilled that promise, that prophecy. Uh, it's a very interesting thing here also. Most of us don't think about it. When we see pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross, we see him with a loincloth on to cover his uh, possible private parts. But that's not the way he was crucified. No, they crucified Jesus like they crucified all criminals, totally nude. There to hang in shame and disgrace and dishonor. That's how Jesus was crucified on the cross for you and for me. Well, verse 25 says, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
And when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about John. He's really saying to Mary, Mary, adopt John. I know he's my cousin, but adopt him as your son. And he turns then to John and he says, John, behold your mother. In other words, make her your adopted mother. In fact, the text says here, from that hour the disciples took, the disciple John took her into his own household, treated her like a mom to take care of her. In fact, tradition tells us that he did that until she died in Ephesus. And of course, John is the only apostle who died of natural causes. There in Ephesus also, every other apostle died a martyr's death. Uh, a, a cruel death, a death of some sort of being either being beheaded or crucified or run through with a, sp- a sword. John takes her and he cares for her until she dies over in Ephesus. John doesn't tell us about the multitude mocking Jesus, nor does he tell us about the uh, two thieves uh, mocking Jesus or the thief mocking Jesus. He doesn't tell us about the robber saying to the other robber, the thief to the other thief, not to mock Jesus rebuking him. He doesn't tell us about Jesus saying, today you will be with me in paradise to one of those thieves. Neither does he tell us anything about it being dark from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Or Jesus saying, Eloi, Eloi, uh, lama sabachthani. He doesn't tell us anything about that. He goes right to the words, I am thirsty. So in verse 28 says, and after this, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. When he says that, he also says something that John does not tell us. John does not tell us that he says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. But he's got to do that. In fact, that fulfills Psalms chapter 31 verse 5, another prophecy that has to be fulfilled. Psalms 31 5 says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Thou hast ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. So John, every, John is telling us the things that were done that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not tell us because we need these things to know that they have fulfilled the Scripture. That there are prophecies that are being fulfilled at this point in time. There are lots of prophecies that have to be fulfilled. Lots of prophecies. In fact, there are still lots of prophecies that have to be fulfilled in our future. Not even taking into account the things that happen from the rapture of the church on, but the things that have to happen between now and the rapture of the church. There are things that have to be fulfilled. When Jesus prophesied and the Lord prophesied in the Old Testament and other places, these things are going to happen. Folks, they are going to happen. Now, you're to live every day as if He shows up tomorrow. You don't want to be disappointed. Do you understand that? Even though there are prophecies that must be fulfilled, there are people who still need to come to the Lord as their Savior, and that is your job, is to tell your testimony to them so they will come and accept Him as Savior. Whether He comes today or whether He comes tomorrow or He comes for you this afternoon makes no difference to you. Live every moment as if He is coming any moment. That's what He asked the people to do and how to live. And that's how that we should have been living all these thousands of years. And some of us, we spend more time on our Facebook, Twitter, and computers than we do on worrying about the souls and salvation of people that are around us. We go out and eat in restaurants, and it just bugs the dick inside of me. We went out to Payway. I guess that's an advertisement, not Payway. Yeah, it's Payway. Pay, pay, what is it? Payway, the Chinese food place? Yeah. And it's a set of ladies that are sitting in front of us. They've gone out to eat together. One of them, phone, her phone rings, and she's on the phone while she's eating with the other lady for 25 minutes. And the other lady's just sitting there kind of like this. And I'm thinking, hmm, what does that say about who's important? Who's important? People are always the important people. You got it? If your phone rings and you're having a discussion with somebody else and that other person doesn't say, go ahead and take it, let it ring. The person on the other side is going to ring you back 1,500 times because we're in this got to have it now society. Got to get hold right now. It's an emergency. Folks, the only emergency is when blood has been shed or you're sick. If death happens, it's not an emergency any longer. You got it? 
What did we do 15 years ago when we didn't have cell phones? What did we do? We drove better. We, we drove better, that's right. <laughs> it was all in God's plan and everybody got handled, all right? It, everything got ha- Do you remember it was just 10 years ago we were all trying to get our house, our house telephone bill under $19 a month? What do you spend on that technology now? Oh, I'm so, <laughs> I don't have to have confessions from the floor, <laughs> but you're paying too much. Internet. <laughs> All we need to do, oh, it doesn't even matter. Never mind. I get it. Anyway, J- John doesn't tell us about the temple veil being torn from top to bottom. He doesn't tell us about the earthquake. He doesn't tell us about the centurion looking up to Jesus and saying, truly, he is the son of God. He doesn't tell us about that. He doesn't tell us about the multitude leaving and grieving as they go. He doesn't tell us about the women watching from a great distance. He goes right to the Jews and what they are concerned about. He says, then the Jews, because it was a day of preparation, so that the body would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. Ask Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The Jews, the religious rabbis, go to Pilate and say, Hey, now, you know, we got to get this deed done here pretty quick, and we got to have them, in the, gotta have them off the cross in the tomb by 6 o'clock because we don't want them hanging over during the Passover time out there, shameful outside, to go through the rest of the Passover season. The Sabbath, the Sabbath is coming. Saturday is starting at 6 o'clock this evening, and we've, we've got to make sure we get them off by that. So will you go out there and have their legs broken? Now, let me tell you how they did that. They did it with a lead mallet. All right? They would go out there basically with a huge sledgehammer and they would beat their legs until they were broken. How do you think they're going to break? Legs are, pre- legs are pretty strong, folks. Pretty strong. You walk, just think about what they're carrying around with most of y'all. Excuse me, I didn't mean to offend you, but you are what you eat. You ate it, you lift it. That's what I think about with some of these women. We go, go around and help them and I pick up their purse and I think, mercy. No wonder they lean like this when they walk. (laughs) You could use a purse to break their legs. They took the sledgehammer and they beat it, a a lead mallet. How many of you ever slammed your finger in the door or something? You know how it hurts? Or hit it with just a little hammer, just a regular hammer, just a 12-ounce hammer, bam, oh! Just think about that when they come and they beat your legs. That was probably nothing. The, the Nailing the nails through the flesh probably did not hurt as much as the breaking of the legs. For whatever reason, we've got lots and lots of theories on what they did and why they did it and how the person died. They broke the legs, basically, and you've heard all of that. That's all gory and everything. Let me just put it simple to you. They broke the legs so that the body would go down and so that the, they, they would basically suffocate is what happened. So they'd be dead on time. So they go out and they, they go out and they beat the legs. And so the pilots came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Okay, there's lots of medical theories and also theological theories of why the blood and water came out, of which I am not an expert in either of them. Neither do I have of the theological theories of why it happened. Enough um, uh, confidence in those theories to tell you what it was. Neither do I have enough confidence in what medical theory it is of why blood and water came in. I'm just going to accept it as fact, and that's what I hope you do. John saw it as blood and water coming out. That's just it. You got it? They pierced his side, and blood and water came out. Don't make anything more of it than that. That's just what it was. It's just what it was. And John is just putting it in there to testify that this is what it was. In fact, that's where he goes. Verse 35. Verse 35. And he who has seen this has seen has testified. In other words, me, John, I'm testifying this is true. And he knows that he I am and John says, I know that I'm telling the truth, so that you may also believe. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you the testimony. He's building this case for believing a testimony of someone. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scriptures. Here we go again. Not one bone of him shall be broken. That fulfills Exodus 12, 46, Numbers 9, 12, Psalms 34, 20. I've got those in the footnotes for you. 
Just a fulfillment. They had to be fulfilled. They had, we had to know that. This portion of the scripture, only John tells us. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, according to the reference here, do not tell us these things. But John wants us to know, those prophecies are not being hung out there unfulfilled. They were fulfilled. Because they had to be. He goes on to say, And they looked on him whom they had pierced. That fulfills Zechariah 12.10. Another prophecy that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not tell us was fulfilled. John's cleaning it up. He's making sure that we know everything that was fulfilled because the Holy Spirit is guiding him to let us to write down for us what happened. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell us the next thing. And these things Joseph of Arimathea, after these things Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews secret disciple. He's not the first one. They were cowards, folks. They followed Jesus in secret. You remember blind Bartimaeus? Been blind since birth. Jesus comes and sees him. He takes down, picks up some mud, spits in it. Gets him a good little, little bat, rolled it out, makes him a couple little piles, rubs it on Bartimaeus' eyes, says, go wash that out in the pool. Bartimaeus goes over to the pool, washes it out. Lo and behold, I can see. Whoa, I can. Whoa, look at that. He had not ever been able to see anything in his life. He is hooping. He is hollering. He is jumping. The, San, the Sanhedrin's go, whoa, what is going on right here? Bring him on into the council. Let's ask him, what are you hollering about? I can see the Messiah, the Christ has healed me. Who is this Messiah, Christ? I don't know. I couldn't see him. He told me, he put, he put mud on my eyes. He told me to go wash it out. I washed him out, and all I know is I can see. He says, you, you, you're, you're claiming him to be the Messiah and the Christ. He says, you know what's a funny thing? You just tell me all this other stuff going on, but i tell you what. He told me to go wash, and I go wash, and now I can see. Who do you think I'm going to believe in? That's the Messiah and the Christ. Bring in his parents. So mom and dad come in. They said, is this your son? Well, yeah, he's our son. Has he been blind from birth? Oh, yeah, he's been blind from birth. How did he get healed? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age, and, and, and we don't want to be put out of the synagogue. So why don't you ask him? We're doing fine. Secret coward followers. But blind Bartimaeus was not a secret coward follower. <laughs> he says to them, all I know is once I was blind, but now I can see. So it doesn't matter what you say. So they put him out of the synagogue. Remember that? He's going to make it as an owner. Then he follows Jesus. No, he actually doesn't follow Jesus. He goes to the temple to worship and praise God. Jesus shows up and says, Hey, boy, how you doing? Not exactly like that. He says it like that. He says it. And Barnabas says, Man, the Messiah came and he anointed my eyes and had me wash it out. And I could see. And Jesus says, I am he. And he worships him. Should have. Joseph Marimathea is one of those coward guys that, that in fact, it's going to even happen when Jesus is gone and the apostles go around, they're healing folks. And if you remember there in the story of the church, the people were afraid, they stood at a distance so they would not be excommunicated from all the uh, uh, events of the, Sanhedrin, of the synagogue, but they still were secret followers of the Lord. <laughs> Joseph Marimathea was a secret follower. He was a coward, but he's not a cowardice anymore. He goes to Pilate, he makes himself known, and he asks for the body of Jesus, and Pilate grants him permission. So he came and he took away the body. Joseph of Arimathea shows up and takes the body off the cross of the Lord. There's Nicodemus next, look at that. Nicodemus, who had come by night, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys. About a hundred pounds worry. About a mercy. Nicodemus, the rich Pharisee, who believed in the Lord and had said to the Lord, how is it possible for me to be reborn again? How is it possible? And became a believer earlier. And when the chief of the Sanhedrin said, we don't believe all this stuff going on, Nicodemus is the one who said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Maybe some of us do. You're not one of his disciples too, are you, he says. Nicodemus cowers back, but now he's not a coward any longer. He's brought a hundred pounds worth of spices. hundred pounds. That's 
not quite half of me. <laughs> Do you know how much 100 pounds weighs? <laughs> I guess that was not a good question, was it? <laughs> Have any of you ever tried to carry two 50-pound sacks of cement at the same time? Because it's only 50 pounds of cement. Just dead weight, just carrying it. It's a lot. It's a whole bunch. I'm sure 100 pounds of spices would cover a body pretty well. And besides that, it would add 100 pounds to it. You follow me? They bring it. So they took the body of Jesus and bowed it in linen cloths with the spices. They wrap, they put this stuff all over the body of Jesus. So if behold, he stinketh, he's not going to smell too bad for a while. And they put it on him, and they wrap him with the cloth, with, with dressings, up a leg, or up the other leg, around his body, around his arms, and they wrap him up like a mummy. You got it? They got time to get this done. And they put him in the, in the, in the tomb, as was the burial custom. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a, to, a new tomb, which no one had been laid yet. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, that's Friday, getting ready for the Sabbath on Saturday, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. That's where they put him, as close as they could. They just took it and put him there. John doesn't tell us about the two Marys watching the burial happen. He doesn't tell us about the Roman soldiers who are guarding the tomb. He doesn't tell us about on Saturday after... Uh, the Sabbath is over at 6 o'clock of Mary's, the two Marys going and getting the spices. Uh, you see, uh, preparing the body was not the job of men. Joseph and Arimathea and Nicodemus were not supposed to prepare that body. Uh, the, uh, they did it quickly. That was woman's work. And so the women go, the two Marys go and buy spices. And then because they're going to wait till the morning to do it, because it's so late, they just rest. John does not tell us about the stone being rolled away by an angel. But he does tell us about Mary showing up, Mary Magdalene. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. In other words, she left home in the dark. She knew the day would be coming up soon, and as she's leaving, it's still dark. And the stone was already taken away from the tomb. Now she, John doesn't tell us about the angels appearing to, to the women or to Mary, but he does tell us what happened. Mary has showed up at the tomb and he's looked in. The stone has rolled away and Jesus is gone. So verse 2, she came, and she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple who Jesus loved. That's John. Simon Peter and John are coming up the road. Mary is sitting in the tomb. It is empty. She's run back to tell Simon Peter and John that, that they've taken the Lord away out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and John went forth and they were going to the tomb. In fact, the other two were running, verse 4, and the other disciple, and the other disciple, which is John, ran ahead faster because he's probably 15 years younger than Peter. And he's, he's out running the old man. They come up to the tomb first. Peter, I mean, John does. And stooping inside, he looks in. But John doesn't go inside. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there. But he did not go in. Finally, when Peter shows up, comes in following him, Peter just goes on in the tomb. You know that's how Peter is. I'll do it, Lord. Yes, sir, I can do it. Here, let's see what we're doing. Just take over control. Kind of reminds me of Emory Gad. <laughs> he, he is not afraid of anything. Whoops, let's back out of here, Jim. I've seen that before. Yes, we had a little altercation going over here at the, under the beltway once. The car was there and the police were all there. And they had some of our church members all gathered around and... J Emory had called me and said, Jim, you need to come over here because so-and-so, such-and-such is going on and there's a problem going on. And Emory's just out there with the police and everything like that. And lo and behold, Mama, who's not a member of the church, she's parked over on our youth parking lot and she's Jay walking right across the corner. And she's got her wig on and just frozen out to right, right there. Blonde just going out there. And Emory goes, Jim, 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 Jim. And he grabs me and starts pushing me. Whoa, 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 get back, back, back. I've seen her before. Whoa, 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 get back, get back, 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 back. I said, what's going on? Back, 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 back. She runs up to the policeman and starts taking his gun out of his, out of his holsters. And I'm going, Emory, back further, back further. Emory, Emory, Emory. What did you get me into? 
other policeman, old Gomez, the constable was there, the Houston police and the constable, Gomez, the constable, he comes over and boy, he slashes onto her. I've never seen anybody put handcuffs on somebody so fast. And she spits out words that I have never heard in my life till that day in time. I would have, I, I don't even know what some of those words mean. They slammed her in the, in the paddy wagon so fast and got her out of there. And I turned around and I said, do y'all know her? Oh, yeah, we know her. Her sheet's longer than his, than her son's. Oh, my goodness. Peter walks out of the tomb. Oh, my goodness. John's standing outside. John sees Peter in there. He goes, he's the younger, remember? Probably by about 15 years. <laughs> we better turn the page and get on with the rest of the scripture. Here's what it says. <clears throat> So Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth which had been on his, on his head was not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, that's John, who had come to the tomb, also entered in, so he slips in with Peter, and he saw and he believed what was happening. But they had not yet, as yet, really truly understood the scriptures that said he must rise again from the dead. And that's from Psalms chapter 19, I mean 16, verse 10. Jesus is fulfilling scripture, and John's telling you this because that's where they were. So the disciples went out again, and they decided to head on back home because his body's not there. And that leaves Mary there because Mary's a typical 100% woman. The man goes... Well, that's it. Let's go home. The woman wants to hang on for a while, right? So she's <laughs> shaking her, all you women are shaking your head up and down. That's right. She's there and she's still looking into the tomb. And she's weeping and she's crying and she's stooped over. And she's just looking there in the tomb. And when she looked in, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the foot. How did she know one was at, how did he know one was at the head and one was at the foot? Because the wrappings were there just as if Jesus was laying there. He just came out of those wrappings. They're still laying there. And that face cloth is rolled over and put over on the corner somewhere, away from the wrappings. Listen, there's all sorts of theories out there on the internet going around what the importance of the, of the folded or rolled cloth, face cloth was, and how it's supposed to apply to this. I don't believe any of that. I believe all it means to us is this was not done in a hurry. Jesus took his time after he came out of those wrappings and left them right there. Not rolled up in a pile, but, but, rolled, but laid out exactly with the feet on one end and the body on the other. He came out of them. Remember, he can do that. And he took the face cloth and rolled it slowly and put it down. He wasn't in a hurry. This was not a stolen body done in a hurry. Besides that, if someone had stolen the body, who would have unwrapped him with all that hundred pounds of stuff on him and left it there in a pile? What are they going to do with the body? If you and me, if we were stealing a body, it'd be get in and get out, right? Let's get in and get out. Unless they thought, well, this body's too heavy. You're going to have to work a little harder on this. Oh, let's get some of this stuff off of him. You're not going to get that stuff off of him. You're not to get that stuff. You can't do that. All that aloe and all that. Can't do that. <laughs> well, the two angels sitting there one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laying and they said to her woman why are you weeping and she said because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him and when she said this she kind of turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Probably she, he's right there. And she's still hanging on to the edge of the tomb. And she's kind of stooped over and she sees the bottom part of him coming up. And she thinks that he is the gardener. And he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. I'm sure she would have tried by herself. You know, that's, that's the woman's way of, I'll get it done. Tell me where he is. I'll go get him and I'll take care of him. And Jesus said, said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. She just latched on to him. 
Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I have ascended to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. She's to go in to tell the testimony of what's just happened. He's also saying to her, look, everything has changed now. Now it's the time for the testimony of those who have seen to tell the world about him, his resurrection. So she runs down and she catches up with Peter and John. Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples that they have seen the Lord and she tells them all that has just happened. Well, John doesn't tell us about Jesus appearing to the other women while that, before that happened. Neither does he tell about the guards going over and report to the priest that Jesus' body has been moved, the stone has been rolled away, somebody has stolen the body. He also doesn't tell that Jesus meets the two on the road to Emmaus. Uh, the Emmaus is about seven miles away from Jerusalem. Remember, you traveled about 20 miles a day, and that's all you traveled in those days for a day's journey. And so uh, they probably were there for the, for the Passover and then the crucifixion happened. They stayed for that. So they stayed over for the Sabbath because you can't travel on the Sabbath. And then on Sunday morning they got up and they took off. And this is just about the right time for them to be almost home about half of a day's journey, a little less than half, about seven miles, not 20, but about seven. And Jesus catches up with them and he walks onto their house and, and, and he goes in the house and he breaks bread with them and then they realize who he is and then he disappears and he makes it back to Jerusalem. Boom, boom. Jesus no longer has any problems with travel plans. You realize that? Where he needs to be, he can be quickly. So what would have taken us a day to go out there and come back? Jesus does it just like that. Doesn't report how he appears to Simon Peter. Neither does John report how he reports to two disciples, the disciples to come into Jerusalem. He skips on to the meeting later on that afternoon when all the apostles are in the room except for Thomas. Ten of them are in the room except for Thomas. So when it was in the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they're still afraid of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to him, whoops, he didn't open the door. Remember, he came out of the wrapping cloth the exact same way. He just showed up. He says, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he bestowed on the, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw him. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Just as the Lord sent me, the Father sent me to do the work that I have done on the last three years, I have empowered you with the same thing. I am sending you out to do the same type of work over the next three years. Folks, that is not a promise to me and that is not a promise to you. That is a promise to those apostles. They're the ones who are in the rooms. We cannot do what he's fixing to give them the authority to do. Watch. He tells them. He says, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Just like he breathed the breath of life into Adam when he was created, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, when it is time for the Holy Spirit to descend on you, you are ready and you are prepared to breathe it in. And then he says to them, look, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. You're forgiven. I can't say that to you. Only God can say that to you. Only Jesus can say that to you. But in this day, those ten apostles could say that to you and your sins were forgiven. If he says your sins are not forgiven, I can't say that to you. Only God can say that. Only Jesus can say that. And in this day, only these ten apostles could say this. They could forgive sins and they could say your sin is staying on you, sticking to you, like stink on a skunk. But we don't have that authority. That's authority only of them. <laughs> but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So to the other disciples, so the other disciples were saying to him, they come to Thomas and say, We have seen the Lord. We have seen him. But he said to them, Unless I have seen uh, see in his hands the imprints of the nails, and put my fingers into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Pretty typical. That's the way we are. Unless I see for myself, I'm not going to believe. Uh -uh. I'm not going to take the testimony of you ten guys. Uh -uh. Thomas has missed it. 
He has missed it. The importance now is for the testimony to be made. Mary Magdalene goes to Simon Peter and to John, and her testimony is only worth 25% of what a man's testimony is worth, and they don't believe her either. But they see her for themselves, and now you've got 10 100% testimonies who are saying to Thomas, Believe. He is risen. And Thomas says, uh-uh, I'm not going to believe. Jesus has a word for him. But he makes Thomas wait. By the way, that's the way it is. Just about the time you think you've got it all and you can speak it into being and you can have the authority to say what you want to say in the name of Jesus, and it doesn't happen. When it doesn't happen, you go back, whoa, what happened? Well, what happened? I've stood at the bedside. I never remember. This is 19 years ago. Stand at the bedside of a little girl who was dying. Her father would place his hands on her and he would pray because she was not going to get better. She had that crystallization in her lungs. She was always in pain, horribly in pain. She was dying. Father would put his hands on her and he'd pray in Jesus' name for her to go on right then. And he really and truly expected that when he took his hands off of her and opened his eyes, she would be gone and it never happened. Day after day, after time after time, when he would go in to see her, he would do this, and it would never work. It never worked. After weeks of us laying down at the Texas Children's Hospital on the floor and all over the creation, staying with the family, laying there night after night after night, I was there every single night. Finally, in the middle of the night, while we're all asleep on the floor, the Lord just said, okay, it's time. Come on. And he took her. And about 30 minutes later, the nurses told us about it. See, we don't have that authority anymore. We don't have that authority to do that. Not like Peter had the authority to say, Ananias, how much did you sell that piece of land for? Is that what you got for it or is that what you just give it? No, that's everything I paid for it, even though he held back somebody. He says, you're going to die. Boom, he died. That didn't happen with us, folks. It only happens with the apostles, not with us. Just like it, he makes us wait. Made Thomas wait. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. They're in that upper room. And Jesus came to the door having been shut. Came, the door having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Whoa! He turns to Thomas and he says, Okay, Thomas, reach here and put your fingers and see, see my hands. And reach over here and put your hands into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Does Thomas do that? No, that's what he's declared. I got it. It's got to happen. That's the way it's going to happen. I've got to see it for it to, for me to believe it. Thomas sees the Lord, and he doesn't do any of that. The Lord already knew what he was thinking because he's God, and t- he sees Thomas, and he says, "Do it. If you want to do it, put your hands right there. Put them in the hell, in, in in my in the in the in the nail prints, and put it in my side." And Thomas doesn't do it. He just looks at him and says, "My Lord and my God." And Jesus says to him, "Because you have seen me, have you believed?" And then he says what I think is the most powerful purpose of this scripture, the whole gospel. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Blessed are they who believe the testimony as being true and yet believed. In fact, John says that next. Look at here. Therefore, there are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Not that you've seen it, that there's been a sufficient enough testimonies that you can believe in something you have not seen. That's the blessing that comes. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. John doesn't leave it there. He's got one more story to tell. The guys, seven guys decide to go fishing. Here they are. After these things, Jesus manifests himself again to the disciples by the Sea of, you know, the sea of Tiberias. That's up the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias is the part of the Bay Area where the city of Tiberias is, and that's called the Sea of Tiberias. It's part of the entire Sea of Galilee. And he manifests himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel And the two sons of Zebedee and the two other disciples were gathered together. And Simon said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, hey, we're going to come too. And they went out and got into the boat. And that night they caught absolutely nothing. But when the day was now breaking, the sun was coming up. Jesus stood on the beach. And yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, hey, children, you do not have any fish, do you? 
They answered him, no. And he said, cast your nets on the right side of the boat. I like that right side, don't you? Don't catch, cast it on the wrong side or the left side. Cast it on the right side, he says. Don't believe that. That's not, uh, that's taking that out of context. Cast it on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard this, he put on his outer garment and threw himself into the sea. He went swimming. It was only about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Where did Jesus get those fish? And where did he get the bread? Already laying there, already cooking, getting the meal ready. And he said to them, Simon, when Simon Peter went up and drew up the net, oh, he said, I'm sorry, he said to them, bring up some of the fish which you have caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them puppies. And although they were not, they were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples even asked the question, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. And it was the third time that Jesus had manifested himself to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. He brought fish. He asked them to bring fish. He had fish already. He said for them to bring fish. It's the same place where he said to these same men, you follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's a perfect example where he says, look, come and have some fish. The fish are laid out, but I want you to bring the fish that you've caught too. You bring some of those fish too and we'll cook those up. We'll put them here and then I will feed you the bread of life because he's the bread of life. John 6, 23 through, 20 through 35. I mean 32 through 35. He says, I'm the bread of life. You see, that's the, what we're supposed to be doing, folks. We're supposed to be bringing the fish to Jesus. Bringing the fish in for men and bringing them to Jesus and then feeding them the bread of life. All you got to do is because Jesus has got some fish and their responsibility is go get some more fish and bring them. That's what our responsibility is. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my lambs. Hmm. Tend my lambs. Tending. I know you like to call people in my position and all the other guys our church leaders, but we're really not your church leaders. We're your church servants. That's what we are. We're shepherds. Shepherds don't lead the sheep anywhere. They serve the sheep. Sheep do four things. Number one is they have other sheep. Number two is they roam around, just roaming around to roam around. Number three, they eat. And number four, they do the other thing besides eat. You got it? That's all they do. They actually grow hair too. And if you don't cut the hair off of them, they will get up on a tree to try to get it off. They'll try to pull it off. Or they'll start munching at it to help each other to pull it off. Jesus is saying here, and we can go all into the part about do you love me. Let's don't go there because that's been covered so many times. Let's go to the tend my sheep, my lambs. Jesus is saying to him, take care of them. Serve them by getting them where they need to be to be fed. So that they eat. Serve them so that... They've got food and they've got water. Serve them by guarding them from all danger. But the most important thing for you to do is to feed them and to water them. Second time says, Simon, son of John, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said, do you know I love you more than these? I'm not going to cover the love issue now. Let's cover the, the issue Jesus says. Jesus says, shepherd my sheep. Shepherd. You know, most ministers do a great job of feeding. They do a horrible job of shepherding. A horrible job. They don't want to be into the shepherding part. You see, shepherding of sheep means that you must bandage the wounds. You must help the young get along. 
You must shelter them from storms. You must protect them from heat. You must pull the thorns out that have to be removed. You must take and get that cruddy stuff out of their eyes that's come down on their faces that stinks so bad. And I could go on and on and on of the things that you have to do to shepherd the sheep. Shepherd my sheep. Simon Peter. Third time he says, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you more than these. And John, Jesus says, tend my sheep. It's a change of the words and rightly so. I know you would think this would fit the first one, but this is really what he's saying the last time. Jesus is saying, take care of the little ones. Not little ones in age, but the little ones that come in who don't know anything better. Like our 75-year-old lady who accepted the Lord last October and came into the church. She's just a little one who needs to be tended to, to bring her up into maturity as quickly as possible. But tend to the children also. And tend to all of you also by feeding you the right kind of food that you need to get you to be mature, the right bread of life. <laughs> but truly, truly, whatever you... Truly, truly, I say to you, talking to Peter. When you were younger, you used to gird yourself up and walk wherever you wished. But when you were older, you will, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you, put handcuffs on you, and bring you where you do not wish to go. Why is Jesus saying this to him? To signify by what kind of death that he will glorify God. That Peter is going to be taken someday. He's going to walk around. He's going to do the things he wants to do. But one day, somebody's going to take him and he's going to die a martyr's death also. They're going to take him where he doesn't want to go. And, if, and in, spite of the author, in spite of and because of the authority that Jesus has given Peter and the others, it will also be taken away from him and he will die an earthly death, a martyr's death. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, follow me. So Peter turned around, he saw the other disciple, and he looked back around, and he, he saw John, and he looked back around, and he remembered that John had been laying on his bosom at the supper, and he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? See, Peter hadn't got it yet. He just hadn't got it. Judas betrayed him, but Peter's worried that it was him who denied him three times that betrayed him. But, but maybe it was John, the younger one. Was it John? So Peter, seeing him, talking about John, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about John? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus said to him, If I want John to remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciples would not die. And yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if he wanted him to remain until he came, that what is that to you? Peter, don't worry about John. Stick to your own business. Follow me. Let me make this applicable to you today. I am not worried one bit about what John Morgan preaches, nor am I worried about what Chuck Snyder preaches or Emory Gad preaches, because they're my three bosses, Emory Gad, Chuck Snyder, John Morgan. I'm not worried about any of the other guys sideways from me, what they're preaching. I am worried about what I am teaching you. I'm not getting into their business. Now, if, my, if I was John Morgan, I would then have the authority to worry about what everybody was saying. John needs to be worried about what I'm preaching and teaching. He needs to be worried. That's his job. But it's not my job to worry about him. Neither is it my job to worry about anybody else who's out there preaching anything else by name. It's not for me to worry about what other pastors are teaching. Be it Jack Hayford, or Chuck Cummings, or Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, Brian McLarion, Rob Bell, Mark Driscoll, Ed Young Jr., Ed Young Sr., 
Name them. That is not my position to worry. My position is just to follow the Lord. Peter, don't worry about John. You follow me. Remember, these are the same two apostles who had said to Jesus, Jesus, those guys over there, they're preaching about you and they're teaching about you and they've not been part of us and they haven't been down at the Sea of Tiberias with us and the Sea of Galilee or down in Jerusalem at the temple. We, they're not even part of the group. They've been part of the masses and they're over there preaching about you. What are you going to do about them? And Jesus says, if they are for us, then they are not against us. Don't worry about them. You worry about you. Peter, don't worry. You follow me. I could call every one of your names and say, don't worry about anybody else. You live your life today to follow the Lord. Well, John doesn't tell us about Jesus then appearing to 500 brethren. He doesn't tell us about him appearing to James. He doesn't tell us about Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives, commissioning the apostles to do their work. He doesn't even tell us about the he's ascending into heaven. He just simply skips to the thing he says. He's already said twice. He's going to say it now the third time. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that this testimony is true. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe just on the testimony. And these things are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. I can tell you this. If I had sat down and written about everything in my life that Jesus has done for me, me alone, not you, just me, this room would be to the ceiling with books filled to the door. And you too. The world cannot contain what the Lord has done for you overlooking your life and guiding you if you have just let him do that. The world could not contain the books of everything Jesus has done. But John ends by saying the third time, this testimony is true. Believe it. Believe. The testimony is written so you can know and believe. You don't need anything else. What a wonderful gospel. Lord Jesus, we finish the gospel that you have written to us through John. Thank you for using John to bring about its words to us. Thank you so much for filling in all the other information that the other gospels did not fill in for us that prove that you are fulfilling everything that was promised through the Old and the New Testament. Lord, we love you. Blessed you are. We give you honor and praise. In your son's name, amen.